a town made famous by its creature-infested dungeon. From his hilltop castle, Baron Sukumvit designed his labyrinth of horrors. When it was built, he issued an annual challenge to all heroes, brave or foolish enough, to wager their souls. Death Trap Dungeon is a fantasy action adventure developed by Asylum Studios and published by Eidos Interactive in spring 1998. Players control brutal pit fighter Chain Dog, or deadly reaver Red Lotus, and seek their fortune in the labyrinthian catacombs beneath the town of Fang. Many heroes have tried to conquer these accursed depths, but none have succeeded, for standing in their way are hordes of maniacs and monsters from the Amazon harem of a demon lord to the oath-sworn knights of the Draconic Order. Even the very dungeon itself conspires against adventurers, every inch riddled with fiendish traps that will leave the unwary burned, bludgeoned, and broken. And should these unfortunates somehow make it to the lowest depths, the colossal fangs of the red dragon Melkor and his abyssal brothers lurk in wait. Will you be the first to overcome these trials, and earn riches beyond measure? Or will you lose your life, and join the countless lost souls that already haunt the halls of Death Trap Dungeon? Death Trap Dungeon was based on the 1984 fighting fantasy gamebook of the same name, written by Games Workshop founder Ian Livingstone. Livingstone and his partner Steve Jackson created the fighting fantasy series as a streamlined and accessible spin on pen and paper role-playing games, bringing the Dungeons & Dragons experience to solo players without all the baggage of complicated rule sets. Around the same time as Death Trap Dungeon was published, Livingstone worked with video game software house Domark, for whom he wrote the text adventure Eureka. After leaving Games Workshop, Livingstone became increasingly involved in the British software industry, and in the early 90s he bought into Domark and became the company's managing director. The first indication of Domark's interest in adapting the fighting fantasy books cropped up in late 1994, where it was announced that there were as yet undefined plans to bring Death Trap Dungeon to PCs, with a tentative 1995 release date. But for much of that year, Domark was enmeshed in a merger with several other British software houses that resulted in the formation of IDOS PLC in October 1995. There's limited information on the earliest stages of Death Trap Dungeon's development, though Livingstone did reveal the title was originally meant to use a first-person perspective, which was then changed to third-person to better accommodate a focus on hand-to-hand -hand combat. It wasn't until January 1996 that Death Trap Dungeon came back into the spotlight, with early prototype screens featuring an unnamed flaxen-haired warrior, and promising a fully 3D RPG experience for both home computers and Sony's new PlayStation games console. There were also plans for a release on the Sega Saturn, though this idea was quickly dropped. Lotomark initially promised a release date of spring the same year, 
an ambitious claim considering what little had been shown of the game by that point, and this was soon pushed back to autumn and then Christmas. By the time the European Computer Trade Show rolled around in spring of that year, Death Trap Dungeon was ready to be shown to the world. It was clear that significant progress had been made on the game over the course of those few months, and most of the early models and environments, including the presumed protagonist, had been overhauled. The game was no longer being marketed as an RPG, instead referred to as a 3D hack and slash, or a third-person dungeon crawler. Ostensibly, in Livingstone's words, because combat and adventure better reflected the books than role-playing did. Eidos and Livingstone heavily promoted the involvement of Games Workshop veterans, in particular Richard Halliwell, who was a senior designer on Warhammer Fantasy Battles and Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. The other major figure was Jamie Thompson, a former White Dwarf editor and fellow fighting fantasy author. Despite these luminaries, in later interviews Livingstone said that most of the development team were young and inexperienced, and that it was a mistake for them to cut their teeth on such a major undertaking. In a 2014 interview with RetroGamer, Livingstone claimed that it was actually for this reason that the game shed the role-playing elements of the original gamebook to focus on pure action. None of this was publicly discussed in 1996, of course. In these early previews, Eidos and Livingstone had nothing but good words for the team, and boasted of the Death Trap Dungeon Engine's technological prowess, including 3D sound and the so-called AI-driven intelligent camera system, which would dynamically reposition itself to assist the player or give them a more cinematic view of the action. Visually, the game was considered by the industry to be highly advanced for its time, being at the forefront of the 3D revolution, alongside upcoming titles like Triton's Into the Shadows and id Software's Quake. It's a measure of the game's hold on public perception at the time that when a little title going by the name Tomb Raider was revealed, PC Gamer referred to it as having a Death Trap Dungeon feel. But the game's industry was moving fast in the 90s, and of course, one year later, Core Design had revolutionised the 3D action-adventure, and already had a highly anticipated sequel on the way, whilst Death Trap Dungeon still languished in development. Eidos launched a fresh marketing blitz at E3 1997, but by this point the game's constant delays had made it a bit of a running joke among journalists. Comparisons to Tomb Raider were rife, especially in PlayStation-oriented magazines, which had paid less attention to the game when it was originally demoed in 1996. Tomb Raider clone or not, with Quake 2 and Unreal on the horizon, Death Trap Dungeon was no longer the technological marvel it had seemed in early 1996. Even in its own genre, the game was set to face stiff competition from other dark fantasy adventures, like Reality Bite's Dark Vengeance, Callisto's Nightmare Creatures, and Treyarch's Die by the Sword. An interview in Next Generation magazine claims that Death Trap Dungeon was meant to launch at the same time as Tomb Raider, but Eidos insisted the game be delayed to make last-minute improvements. And in an interview with PC Gamer, Asylum said that Tomb Raider's success had forced the team to rethink many existing features, and even completely redesign the game's opening levels. But the most notable change revealed that year was a new playable character, a shapely warrior woman with a suspicious resemblance to a certain buxom British adventuress. Referred to at the time as the Amazon, a Red Lotus quickly became the central figure in marketing and previews, with many publications reacting positively, or at worst with light amusement, to her Conan-esque fashion sense. One or two lonely voices did cry foul, however. Computer Gaming World's Elliot Chin bitterly complained of the character's ridiculous armour, and the trend of female heroes who look more like sluts than warriors and the magazine singled out Eidos for its apparent reliance on the bimbo factor to market its games. Sometime towards the end of 1997, the character did get a new outfit in the form of a comparatively demure leather bodysuit, but it didn't stop Next Generation taking issue with her in their January 1998 article Girl Trouble, 
Despite the costume change, it's unlikely Eidos were particularly bothered by these criticisms. As they'd seen great success flaunting Lara Croft's considerable polygonal assets, and later took another page out of Tomb Raider's marketing book with a Death Trap Dungeon photo shoot featuring Page 3 model Kelly Brook. Death Trap Dungeon was finally released for PlayStation in March 1998, with the PC version following a couple of months later. Reviews for both versions ranged from mixed to positive, with most reviewers praising the game's simple control scheme, inventive level design, diverse cast of monsters, gory dismemberment system, and cheeky humour. However, there was also widespread criticism of the game's intelligent camera system, weak enemy AI, shallow and repetitive combat, and various minor bugs. Reviews of the PlayStation version were also more likely to criticise the game for failing to stand up to Tomb Raider 2, whilst PC reviewers dismissed the added multiplayer functionality and were particularly critical of the game's use of fixed save points, which they viewed as a technological limitation of the PlayStation version, rather than a conscious design choice. Next Generation magazine seemed to have completely forgotten its original enthusiasm for the game, awarding it just one star and calling it bad, bad, bad in a rather petulant review. The game reportedly did sell quite well, and Livingstone stated there were plans regarding a prequel or sequel to be based on the fighting fantasy gamebooks City of Thieves or Citadel of Chaos, depending on the interview. But nothing was ever heard of this again. The development team for Death Trap Dungeon quietly scattered to other software houses or retired from the industry entirely, and in later interviews Livingstone apologised for the game, attributing its sales solely to the brand and stating it was not what fans deserved. In fact, Livingstone rarely mentions the game these days unless directly queried, and seems prouder of his role in acquiring core design and supporting Tomb Raider whilst at IDOS. Nevertheless, Death Trap Dungeon retained a small cult following over the years, partly due to its notorious level of difficulty and partly for its marketing campaign and iconic heroine. The original gamebook has also received various other video game adaptations, such as the Fighting Fantasy Classics version in 2018 and 2020's Death Trap Dungeon, the interactive video adventure, narrated by actor Eddie Marson. The latest attempt is Death Trap Dungeon The Golden Room, an interactive movie scheduled for release in 2022. The player's goal in Death Trap Dungeon is quite simple. Descend each floor of the dungeon, battling monsters and collecting treasure, until they reach the lair of the dragon. Although individual floors may give more specific objectives, such as uncovering a treasure hoard or freeing the souls trapped in a demon lair, these are really just decoration for a more straightforward formula, which is to progress through each level until they reach an elevator or teleporter to a lower floor. It's everything in between that'll slow you down. Colour-coded gates, secret doors, fake walls and pulsing energy barriers have to be circumvented, usually by finding keys, pulling levers or fulfilling some arbitrary scripted condition. Most of the time you'll find everything you need through a bit of exploration. Levels can be large, but not nearly as open and convoluted as the classic Tomb Raider games. Puzzles aren't really a big part of regular gameplay, unless you count flipping all the switches in the same room, but they do somewhat come into play with the many traps that could turn almost any room into the player's tomb. Be prepared to be skewered by javelins, roasted by flames, or given a practical demonstration of Newtonian physics at a moment's notice. The exact layout of the dungeon and its various challenges can be quite different depending on whether you're playing on PC or console. Although broadly speaking the overall dungeon is very similar, on PlayStation each floor has been chopped up to compensate for technical limitations. But this goes beyond simply dividing the PC levels into multiple sub-levels. In some cases, entire rooms have been resized, repositioned, or replaced entirely, 
some of the opening levels of the PlayStation version are mostly absent on PC, whilst the PC's pseudo-stealth chapter, The Quarry, is just gone on the PlayStation. Enemy and item placement is sometimes rearranged, and many traps or platforming sequences have been subtly redesigned. But regardless of the platform you're playing on, navigating all these obstacles means getting to grips with those beloved third-person tank controls that were so ubiquitous in console games of the mid to late 90s. The camera is usually fixed behind the player unless it's triggered by one of the intelligent camera spots that might cause it to give a more cinematic view of proceedings. Regular movement lets you move forward or backwards, or turn left or right. You can't strafe or move freely in any direction with the directional keys, though like Tomb Raider, holding down an extra button puts the character in shuffle mode, letting you sidestep, inch towards precipices, or tiptoe across narrow bridges without fear of walking off the edge. Controls don't really differ significantly between PC or PlayStation here. Where you will notice a small difference is when you inevitably run into one of the multitudinous nasties patrolling the dungeon. On PC, melee combat is handled in conjunction with the directional buttons, so the attack button doesn't actually do anything itself. A forward attack results in a heavy downward chop, attacks from the left or right will perform a jab or slash, and holding down the back button puts you in the block stance. On PlayStation, you can just hit the attack button to jab, and blocking is a separate button. Accessing ranged combat items or spells differs more significantly. On the PC, these are bound to hotkeys and the numbers, so for example switching to the blunderbuss means hitting F2 followed by number 1, whilst you'd hit F4 followed by number 2 to drink an antidote. On the PSX, the game pauses after hitting the select button, giving the player plenty of time to browse their inventory with the D-pad. Attacking with spells and ranged weapons is mostly the same on PC and PlayStation, with spells bound to a separate button and ranged combat replacing melee controls. The player fires or casts offensive spells in whatever direction they currently face, unless an enemy is tagged by the auto-aim. More precise aiming is enabled by a first-person camera mode, which is slightly awkward to control on both platforms, but does have the handy secondary use of letting the player inspect the environment more easily. All of these environments, on PC or PlayStation, are naturally populated by foes that impress in both number and variety. The first enemies you'll face are best dispatched with the regular sword, but you'll quickly run into a number of creatures that encourage the use of specific tools. The deadly flame-spouting automatons should be dealt with using ranged attacks, such as the fireball, whilst larger mechanical foes really need explosives like bombs or firecrackers. Even the basic melee weapons will branch out into more specialised roles, with the green venom sword best employed against giant insects, snake woman and half-breeds, and the magic warhammer for rock golems. Aside from the regular sword, stone hammer, and entirely pointless unarmed mode, melee weapons have a very limited number of charges, and finding copies just recharges the one you're already holding. It's all very well to be carving through hordes of skeletons and zombies with your silver sword, but if its power dissipates and you're left with a regular blade, you'll be in big trouble. So it's a good idea to use these weapons strategically, and not waste them on foes they're not suited for. But even having the right weapon might not be enough to pull the player through, which is where potions, charms, and power-ups come in. There's staples like health potions and antidotes, but also pickups that will buff your hit points beyond their usual maximum, an invisibility charm, various types of elemental damage wards, and strength and speed boosts. The latter are best saved for bosses or tougher combat gauntlets, though there is a limit to the number you can carry at once, and you'll usually find at least one or two per level, so they don't need to be hoarded. But at the end of the day, none of this will stop the player from dying horribly more than a few times over the course of each level. Upon dying, you'll have to either restart from the beginning of the level, obviously more onerous in the larger PC levels than the smaller ones on PlayStation, or load from the last save point. Saving can only be done at fixed points around each level, either a floating white skull that can be used as many times as you wish, 
or a red skull that requires five gold crowns from the player's rather limited treasure stash. As you can imagine, white save points are reasonably common at the start of the game, but are encountered less frequently as you progress through the dungeon, eventually getting to the point where they're potentially 20 to 30 minutes of playtime apart. Also, the game does enjoy occasionally cutting off access to earlier save points for no discernible reason, then tempting the player with red skulls once they've sweated a bit. If you want to conquer Death Trap Dungeon and become the hero of Fang, then expect a lot of dying, a lot of reloading, and a lot of repetition before the final credits roll. Next Generation's scathing one-star review of Death Trap Dungeon might have been a bit of an outlier back in 1998, but you won't have much trouble finding more recent criticism of the gameplay. There are more than a few user reviews on Steam or GOG declaring Death Trap Dungeon the worst game ever, and I'm not surprised the game inspires such a reaction. Now, the basic melee combat in Death Trap Dungeon is really not that frustrating. It's certainly a bit clunky, and players who think they can rush into the middle of a horde of orcs and start pulling off stylish counters like in the Batman or Assassin's Creed games are going to be disappointed. But the directional attack system isn't too complicated. Most enemies have very basic attack patterns, and after fighting a few of the same type, you'll quickly realise certain attacks counter enemy movesets more effectively than others. In fact, PC reviewers at the time observed the melee combat seemed particularly uninspiring compared to the recently released Die by the Sword, which received mixed reviews but was praised for trying something new with its sword fighting mechanics. Death Trap Dungeon's combat seems shallow in comparison. The male character, Chain Dog, is supposedly a bit stronger and slightly slower than Red Lotus, but it seemed to me that there were also subtle differences in the timing and reach of each character's attacks. So it felt like one character's combos just happened to stun lock or outreach certain enemy types more than their counterparts did. But having the correct weapon is a more relevant factor, as, for example, it might take two or three swings of the Venom Sword to kill a half-breed priestess, but maybe nine or ten swings of the default weapon, which is also less likely to stagger them and interrupt their own attacks. It's not that player skill doesn't come into the equation at all, but there isn't a whole lot of depth to the melee combat, and you're not going to have much opportunity to try anything fancy when fighting more than one opponent anyway. I will say that blocking and performing backward attacks was a lot more convenient on the PlayStation, but it also seemed like stab attacks had greater range on the PC, or perhaps certain enemies had larger hitboxes or something, so in the end it pretty much evens out. The melee combat does seem particularly awkward when fighting larger enemies. Tomb Raider beat the game to the finish line in wowing players with titanic 3D monstrosities, but it also had the benefit of revolving around ranged combat and auto-aim. At the end of the day, a bat, a bear, and an abomination are all just moving targets to Lara's pistols. But Death Trap Dungeon had to make dragons and giant robots plausible opponents for metal toothpicks that barely reach their knees. And whilst it works, it's not exactly elegant. Certain large enemies have tough hides that cause weapons to bounce off harmlessly, so you usually have to try and go for the head or similar weak spot. But targeting specific body parts is extremely difficult, so all you can do is try and manoeuvre into the best position and hope your foes are considerate enough to put their vulnerable parts in harm's way. This might sound horribly frustrating, but giant-sized enemies don't always have that much health or damage output, so with the correct weapon type and perhaps a couple of power-ups, you should prevail easily enough. One exception to this is the Pit Fiend, aka the T-Rex, which will relentlessly chomp down on the player with high damage attacks as soon as you're in range. One way to deal with these is to turn the environment against them, like in a rather fun little sequence where you lead these prehistoric pea brains into trapped rooms. The other solution is to resort to spells and ranged combat. Some old reviews were very critical of Death Trap Dungeon's ranged combat, probably due to a combination of the auto-aim being rather wonky, the intelligent camera making it difficult to see what you're actually looking at, and the first-person camera rooting you to the spot. 
I don't think things are too bad with the blunderbuss or flamethrower, which are meant to be close range weapons, and the grenade launcher isn't meant for precision in the first place. But I pretty much gave up on using the dragon's tongue and firecracker. The first is too reliant on the auto-aim, and the second is just too slow to be worth using, especially since it's not even that damaging against bosses. I think the spells are particularly unwieldy with the camera and auto-aim, as many of them don't stack that high in your inventory, aren't necessarily that common as loot, and are quite easy to miss with, so there's a very good chance you'll burn through an entire stack in a single battle. So yes, the combat in Death Trap Dungeon has some tough spots and is definitely very 90s in its controls, but it's probably not what provokes such fury in some players. The reason for that is almost certainly the platforming, traps, and save system. The game's platforming is almost a dead ringer for Tomb Raiders, gymnastics included. And whilst it's lacking a few classic moves, in itself it isn't terrible by the standards of fifth generation console titles. Unfortunately, the platforming really is made so much worse by that not-so-intelligent camera that Eidos inexplicably considered the game's marquee feature. Lining up many of the jumps is made unnecessarily difficult, especially under a time limit when you suddenly have to reorient yourself with a sudden perspective shift. A YouTube commentator claiming to be the game's programmer, Phil Drinkwater, has stated that Death Trap Dungeon's control scheme was being developed at the same time as the levels were being built, and was originally meant for use in much larger environments. Even so, they wouldn't be nearly as frustrating were it not for the fixed save points, which also exacerbate the game's ruthless tricks and traps. From collapsing floors to walk-in human ovens, most of these will either do significant damage or mean an immediate game over. There is a degree of player skill involved, as many have subtle environmental tells, like a pile of corpses or suspicious little devices poking out of the wall, to tip you off that something is fishy here. But just as many of these carry no warnings, even for observant players, and knowing there's a trap nearby doesn't guarantee you know how to actually deal with that trap. It could be you're meant to run in the opposite direction, it could be you're meant to trigger a protective spell, it could mean you're meant to flip a switch somewhere else to disable it, and so on. You can't always be sure. In a great many cases, it seems like a classic case of trial and error, plus the error will instantly kill you and send you half an hour back to your previous save point. The game's fixed save points were neither an accident nor, I'm assuming, a limitation of console hardware carried over to the PC version. The developers clearly designed each level around this mechanic, raising the tension to almost unbearable levels by positioning save points between gauntlets of savage beasts and narrowly avoided pitfalls, and, in fairness, Finally being rewarded with a save point after an especially lengthy period of danger certainly gets the dopamine flowing. But the trial and error nature of these sequences is going to be a bit much for some players. Personally, I never considered actually quitting wholesale, but I did become extremely frustrated at various points. There is no way on earth any reasonable person could possibly call this game hard but fair. It's hard, but it sure as hell isn't fair. So it's no wonder plenty of people gave up on the game, both back in 1998 and more recently. In a twisted sort of way, you could argue, contra Ian Livingstone, that Death Trap Dungeon really did capture the spirit of the original gamebook. In the book, as in the game, you often run into unfair situations that brought your journey to an abrupt end, and conquering Death Trap Dungeon did involve repeating certain challenges multiple times until you figured out the optimal path. That said, Ian Livingstone frequently jokes about how often he saw people cheating their way through his books with the old five-finger bookmark. That is, rather than restarting the book from the beginning when killed, players would instead bookmark their progress at various stages and read ahead to get a sense of how each choice might play out. Now, Death Trap Dungeon the game may not ask you to restart the adventure from the beginning, but losing 30 minutes of intense, potentially stressful progress is still considerably more frustrating than having to flip a few pages back in a book. 
A better analogy for the five finger bookmark would have been manual saving wherever the player wished, as the Tomb Raider sequels flirted with on the PlayStation. Regardless, that isn't how Death Trap Dungeon was designed, and by, say, playing the game on an emulator and using save states, you are circumventing an important aspect of the experience. Using manual saves certainly makes Death Trap Dungeon less frustrating, but it also removes an enormous amount of tension that forced tough decision making regarding resource management. The game's final boss represents this whole experience very well, as he's protected by an incredibly annoying gauntlet of instant death traps, some of which you really have no reasonable way of noticing until you're killed by them. It's tempting to ask, as more than one reviewer did, why a save point wasn't placed between the traps and the actual boss fight. But the boss himself is actually not that tough, so the thrill of victory only comes from successfully completing the full sequence of challenges. Traps, platforming, combat, and all of that. After Death Trap Dungeon's digital re-release on PC, a number of user reviews characterised the game as a sort of proto-Dark Souls, and for once I think that's a useful comparison when thinking about whether someone would enjoy the game. As with the Souls games, Death Trap Dungeon's intense difficulty has pros and cons in equal measure, and it offers a simple question to the player. Are the highs of suspenseful dungeon delving and the thrill of victory worth the frustration of cheap deaths, time-consuming setbacks, and agonising repetition? For many people, probably not. Death Trap Dungeon would have been a visually stunning game had it been released back in 1996, and two years later it may not have been revolutionary, but it certainly wasn't bad looking. One point every review agreed on was that Death Trap Dungeon had an impressive variety of different enemies to battle. There's staple fantasy enemies like orcs, undead, and evil knights, plus giant insects, steam-powered automatons, killer clowns, snake girls, demons, and imps riding giant feet. There are also a few enemies I assume come from the designer's earlier involvement in creating the Warhammer fantasy universe. The gun-toting rat men are the most obvious influence, but the demon-worshipping cultists also reminded me of the old punk-inspired chaos thugs of the 80s. The collector's version of Death Trap Dungeon came with a cool little art book bestiary and playing cards featuring the game's heroes and villains. The heroes strike pretty good figures, the hulking chain dog and the lissom red lotus, although the latter's concept art and FMV model is completely different to their in-game incarnation and marketing renders. Ian Livingston says Lotus is a composite of real-life beauties and comic book vixens, but it's hard not to assume Lara Croft had some influence on the final design. Oddly enough, what doesn't seem to have heavily influenced the art direction is the original fighting fantasy book itself. Most of the enemies encountered in the book, like troglodytes, hobgoblins, giant worms, trolls, and the mirror demon, didn't make the cut, although the iconic blood beast does make a brief appearance as a throwaway boss. Still, with the exception of the rather spindly minotaurs, most of the creature models are visually distinct and reasonably detailed up close, and most enemies have unique animations to give them a bit more character, like the clowns performing a little dance or skeletons playing football with their own skulls. Larger enemies also look impressive, especially considering the strain they were no doubt putting on systems of that era. Back at release, PC reviewers warned readers that Death Trap Dungeons should not be played without a 3D accelerator card. On the subject of those reviews, both the PS1 and PC versions of the game were criticised for some issues with visual bugs, like clipping and visible seams on environment and character models. These are particularly obvious at higher resolutions, especially on Red Lotus, whose torso seems to want to fly off the rest of her body during certain animations. It's a curious oversight for a main character model, and certainly gave the impression of the game being less polished than its contemporaries, such as Tomb Raider 2. 
All the same, reviewers were soon distracted by other visual flourishes, like some of the impressive particle effects and, of course, the dismemberment system. Back in early previews, Asylum Studios claimed combatants would get hands chopped off and still continue fighting, and whilst this particular feature didn't make it into Death Trap Dungeon, there'll still be plenty of extremities flying about during battles. You can chop off hands, arms, legs, heads, wings, tentacles and other unidentified body parts, and watch the blood spurt everywhere, even run down walls or drip from the ceiling like strawberry jam. On the PC version, you can even watch the player character get covered in wounds as they lose health, and see crossbow bolts sticking out of their flesh, though the latter looks a bit silly. There are much more significant differences between the PC and PlayStation versions when it comes to environmental design, though. Both versions can handle some pretty big scenes, like towering castle walls, a heavily fortified bunker complex, and an oversized dinosaur lair, though the PC version is obviously able to handle much larger levels. So not only are levels cut into more manageable chunks on the PlayStation, many individual rooms are also slightly smaller than on PC. The most obvious example of this is the level set in a sacrificial pit. On PC, this is a massive environment, a huge circular shaft with multiple tiers, side passages and adjacent rooms, whereas on PlayStation it's cut into two separate levels, losing the sense of depth and scale. So it'd be natural to assume that the PlayStation version is just the PC version with smaller levels, a lower resolution and lower quality assets. But for some reason, the art direction is also quite different in some of these levels. The broad strokes are the same, but on PlayStation it seems like some of these levels have been given a lot of little extra touches to make them seem more detailed and distinct. In some cases it seems like static light sources were added to make scenes more colourful, perhaps to compensate for the PC having better dynamic lighting. In others, the geometry is mostly the same, but the textures are different. In many cases, extra decoration has been added, like different frescoes or banners adorning the walls. In some cases, these assets exist only in the PlayStation version. When I first saw that some of these obscene images from the PC version had been modified on PlayStation, I assumed it was some form of censorship. But the original versions are found later on, as well as another variation on this picture, so it must have just been to add variety. Now some of the levels are pretty much identical, but others definitely look more vibrant and flavourful, such as the Circus of the Damned, which is much more carnivalesque on the PlayStation. I'm confused as to how this happened, as the PC version was actually released two or three months after the PSX version, and I can't think of any sort of hardware limitation on PC that would explain these changes. But if I had to speculate, I'd posit that the PC levels are the originals, and in modifying them for the PlayStation release, the developer had the opportunity to spend some time touching them up a bit. It's possible that the artists and level designers on the PC version were then already busy with another project, or perhaps working on the utterly pointless multiplayer levels, so none of these additions were backported, so to speak. Another explanation might be to do with the quality of these assets. Some of the extra art in the PlayStation release is of a very low quality, even compared to the already lower quality textures that were taken from the PC version and then modified. In the PlayStation version of the Lair of the Medusae, there are a number of statues that are clearly models from the early 1996 build of Death Trap Dungeon. It's possible that a lot of these assets are recycled from this earlier build, and whilst they look fine on PlayStation, they would have been a lot more noticeable at the higher resolutions of the PC version. It would be interesting to go through the files in each version and see if there's any other content from the prototype builds, such as the mummies that were cut at some point, but I'm not sure whether there's any way to extract the files, as despite Death Trap Dungeon's similarities to Tomb Raider, it has always used its own engine. In any case, differences in the game's sound design aren't as stark as the visuals. Both versions rely quite heavily on stock sound libraries, but it all works well enough in-game. Some of the monsters have obvious oral cues that give them away, such as the clanking automatons or the squelching, shuffling zombies. 
They're also clear enough to be of use in the middle of fights, so you can usually hear an axe pirouetting towards you even if there's not much you can do about it. The blunderbuss has a nice ring to it that makes blowing things to bits even more satisfying, and the sounds of steel cleaving flesh are very enjoyable too. Back in 1996 previews, Asylum were very proud of their 3D sound model, claiming that different materials would affect environmental noise and muffle combat sounds to greater or lesser degrees. Unfortunately, it didn't work too well in the PC or PlayStation versions I played, with certain noises suddenly popping in and out of earshot rather than gradually growing louder or quieter. Save points are particularly annoying, as they seem to be unaffected by how many walls, floors or ceilings are in the way, tricking the character into thinking they're close to one when they're actually blocked by impassable terrain. Another disappointment is the total lack of voice acting. The verbal repertoire of the game's cast is limited to grunts, gibbering and incoherent screaming. The opening FMV with the narrator is the only exception. I couldn't find the actor listed in the credits, but they sounded like they were giving their best Dungeon Keeper impression. Hoping that maybe, just maybe, one day a champion will rise. One area of the sound design where the PlayStation's limitations are audible is in the music, which has been modified and is of noticeably lower quality than on PC. I believe the PC re-releases actually had their music files updated a few years ago, so maybe the difference is more exaggerated due to that, but it was common at the time for the PSX to use MIDI or lower quality audio samples compared to PC. Whatever the case, the music, which I assume was composed by Mike Ash and Steve Monk, is pretty minimalist, relying on fairly repetitive loops to simulate action or spooky ambience. It does a perfectly good job, but I don't think PS1 players were losing too much nuance or subtlety with their version's simplified soundtrack. In terms of playing Death Trap Dungeon today, both versions are pretty easy to acquire and get working. The GOG version runs perfectly fine under the N-Glide wrapper, though I was disappointed to find out that nobody has made a proper widescreen hack for Death Trap Dungeon, especially considering far more obscure games have received one. I did get two or maybe three crashes over the course of the game, and it's worth noting that they all occurred when activating a save point, so they're extremely rare, but they could potentially happen at the most infuriating times imaginable. A Steam version is also available, though I've heard mixed reports on whether it's the same or inferior to the GOG release, which had to be patched under the table a couple of times due to launch errors and music bugs. If I have one major complaint about the GOG version, it's that the extras are very disappointing. There are no wallpapers or concept art. All you get is a manual and a very low quality scan of the bestiary. I understand GOG probably relies on the publisher to provide these materials, though they have gone out of their way to find goodies for other, more popular games before. Come on guys, I'm sure there's someone at Square Enix or an old games site that still has a bunch of old press kit material or marketing renders. The PlayStation version is obviously a little less convenient to acquire, but there are used copies on eBay and Amazon for pretty reasonable prices, and it's no trouble at all to emulate the game through, say, Duck Station. Modern PS1 emulators like this have the benefit of being able to run the game at a much higher resolution and enable PGXP, which significantly reduces the notorious warping effect of PS1 games. I'm not sure I really recommend either version over the other. The PC version obviously has larger levels and higher quality base assets, like better texture and audio sample quality. But we're talking about a game from 1998 here, and some people may well prefer to play Death Trap Dungeon in its original lower res form anyway. The PS1 version has a few areas with better art direction and uses a less frustrating pause screen for switching between weapons and items, and also has slightly more save points. Another reason to consider PS1 emulation is access to save states, which let you play the game in a more traditional way and save wherever you like, and you can try messing around with widescreen hacks and such, though I never got these working acceptably on Duck Station, without either stretching or weird rendering bugs at the side of the screen. 
If you did enjoy playing one version of Death Trap Dungeon, then it's certainly worth considering trying the other, as whilst I wouldn't call them completely different games, they do somewhat feel like remixes of one another, with a small amount of extra unique content in each. Either way, there are no real barriers to playing Death Trap Dungeon today. Fang was once known as the Town of Plenty. Today, men call it the Town of Lost Souls. Baron Sukumvit rules this grim place, a tyrant whose dominion was so complete, so unassailable, that he became bored and marshalled all his resources in the construction of a massive labyrinthian dungeon beneath the hills that overlook the town. The Baron, ever a fan of games and always hungry for greater notoriety, issued a challenge to any and all who would heed the call of The Walk. Conquer Death Trap Dungeon, the Baron promised, and he would not only shower the hero with rewards, but relinquish his grip on Fang forever. Sukumvit invited his dark allies to divide the dungeon among themselves, and do as they wish with the citizens of Fang. Over the years, the dungeon has swelled with evil forces, from the orcs of the Taloned Eye to the cult of the necrodemon Agrash. Yet for all their savagery, cunning, or insanity, none of these factions can challenge the dominance of the mighty red dragon Melkor, who, in his venerable old age, has retired to the dungeon to enjoy the sport of the heroes who venture within. Each year, the desperate townsfolk spend three days to fate volunteers attempting the walk, hoping against all odds that one of these contestants will prove to be Fang's saviour. Each year, these heroes embark upon their quest, and are never heard from again. This year, among the challengers are two rather less reputable adventurers. Chain Dog was raised in the brutal war pits of the barbaric North, even after slaying his masters and escaping confinement, Chain Dog knows nothing but violence and death. With the fame and riches of Death Trap Dungeon, perhaps he could finally make a new life for himself and earn a name of his own. Equally infamous is the Reaver and Corsair Red Lotus. Her beauty has brought many admirers, but after a life of terror and betrayal, there is no space left in her heart for aught but greed and ambition. She cares nothing for the people of Fang, but the wealth she might earn in liberating them could finally bring peace to her heart. The background lore and setup I just summarised for you aren't really all you're going to get out of Death Trap Dungeon's story. Nothing really happens in Death Trap Dungeon. The player character makes no observations, converses with nobody, learns nothing, and grows in no appreciable way. There are no NPCs, no scraps of lore hidden around the dungeon, no relationships between different characters or factions. There's a short text blurb at the start of each level that gives you some hints of what's to come, but nothing beyond that. You enter a floor, the floor is populated by a specific enemy type, and you move on to the next floor until there are no more floors left and the dragon is defeated. Even the final cutscene offers nothing, essentially laughing in the player's face and telling them that nothing they did mattered in a rather curious waste of the project's FMV budget. It's a shame that we didn't get, at the very least, some voice acting from Lotus and Chain Dog as they made their way through the dungeon even if they were just a few one-liners that helped illustrate their characters. I quite liked the fact that the two of them were set up to be anti-heroes, and just having them make some cold-hearted or darkly humorous comments on the various corpses strewn around would have given them much more of a presence. Even the first Tomb Raider, with its very basic storytelling, had FMV cutscenes showing off Lara's larger-than-life personality, and spent a bit of time showing off the villains, too. By comparison, all I learned about Red Lotus outside of the manual is that she likes doing her nails, 
Considering the game is set in one enclosed location, it's unfortunate Death Trap Dungeon didn't bother trying to flesh out the various factions that the manual and bestiary tell us are fighting for supremacy over coveted locations in the dungeon. How about a few scraps of paper revealing some of the backstabbing and power struggles that would inevitably be going on in such situations? It's a shame that the game didn't draw more from the book's non-combat scenes, like Sukumvit's riddling trial masters, the failed contestants who had survived to become the dungeon's caretakers, or the battle of wits with the troll wife. But one element that really would have helped are interactions with your competitors. In the book, the barbarian Throm is one of the few of that year's contestants to have survived as long as the player, and there's a whole series of decisions to make regarding whether to accept him as an ally of convenience or look for an opportunity to stab him in the back. In the game, the only reminder that this is a multi-person competition is the abundance of skeletons scattered about the levels. It would have been cool to see your competitors as you progressed through Death Trap Dungeon. Perhaps as a warning of coming threats, as mini-bosses, or as NPCs. But these aren't the only things that were left behind in the gamebook. People who haven't read the original Fighting Fantasy gamebook are probably unaware that the town of Fang had a very strong Indo-Chinese flavour. When Livingstone wrote Death Trap Dungeon, he drew upon his experiences as a youth backpacking around northern Thailand. Fang, the Trial of Champions, the province of Chiang Mai, and Sukhumwit are all real places and events, and there are numerous little references to Southeast Asian elements in the book. A lot of reviewers were obviously unaware of this too. Charlie Brooker's PC Zone review of the game had a little sidebar mocking what the magazine assumed were either stupid generic fantasy names or filthy jokes. In fairness, the game does nothing to indicate otherwise. Obvious tells like Chiang Mai are not mentioned, Sukumwit is pronounced as it sounds in the intro movie, and it's perfectly reasonable for reviewers to assume the game meant these names as jokes, since it does lay on the humour pretty thick in some parts. Tonally, at times the game is quite grim, with its brutal violence, haunting ambience, and dark atmosphere. Other times the gore is slapstick and death is a nasty joke. A game where you're chased by imps riding giant feet, killer clowns taunt you with armpit farts, and exploding war pigs are part of your arsenal, is probably not meant to be taken too seriously. If you've watched my other reviews, you probably know I'm not a big fan of games that try to joke around and won't commit to their own stories, but I wasn't all that bothered by this in Death Trap Dungeon. The lack of voice acting and in-game texts probably helps. If the game were made today, I have no doubt it would be full of internet memes and Game of Thrones references or something. I wonder to what extent Livingstone himself thinks about how he would betray Death Trap Dungeon's world today, as in a recent interview he mentioned he would have loved to see the game remade by a developer like Bioware. Going through archived versions of Death Trap Dungeon's official website, I noticed that some versions of the story seem to depict Melkor as the original villain, and Baron Sukumvit as the former ruler of Fang, who issues the challenge for the express purpose of freeing Fang from the reign of the dragon. This is different to the original gamebook and its sequel, Trial of Champions, where the Baron and his brother are villains, and the final game, where Sukumvit is, again, the villain despite not being spoken to nor interacted with in any way. Maybe the story on the website was written by someone at IDOS Marketing who wasn't familiar with the details, but it seems possible that the developers intended to go in a different direction with Sukumvit. As it stands, he's basically an unresolved plot point, although considering the game's bizarre and abrupt ending, pretty much everything in the dungeon is an unresolved plot point. So I'm definitely in the camp that would have preferred Death Trap Dungeon's setting be approached more like a traditional RPG, with side quests, NPCs, dialogue, more puzzles, and non-combat challenges. It would have been interesting if things were set up more like Ultima Underworld, with a better sense of the dungeon's ecology and factions, and more non-linear exploration. 
Of course, putting greater emphasis on Death Trap Dungeon's story and world building would open it up to even more detailed scrutiny, and the whole concept of Death Trap Dungeon is quite silly, even by fantasy standards. It's somehow a house of horrors, temple complex, self-sustaining environment for dozens of different races, cult headquarters, giant tomb, war zone for insect warriors and technologically advanced ratmen, and, of course, site of an annual competition. Also, there's an inverted tower at the bottom with flying turtles. But I don't think it would be difficult to adjust things to make the setting more plausible. Similar locations exist in plenty of other fantasy universes, and there are certainly stories that actually lean into the inherent implausibility of a dungeon environment and its implications. Death Trap Dungeon deserves a better representation than a sort of deadly zoo slash amusement park, a series of wholly unrelated challenge rooms populated by random beasts that don't interact with each other at all. There are plenty of titles out there that have done dark fantasy, dungeon settings, and general storytelling much, much better justice than this game. Despite its difficulty, overall I had an alright experience with Death Trap Dungeon on PC. I liked it enough that my curiosity of the PlayStation version carried me through that campaign too. It's not a game that excels at combat, platforming, puzzles, secret hunting, atmosphere, progression, or anything other games haven't done better, but it's competent enough at all of them only falling short at story and world building, where it fails to meet even the extremely low standards of the average late 90s action adventure. Now, recommending titles that do things better than Death Trap Dungeon is easy, it's more a question of what specific element of dungeoneering appeals to you. Ultima Underworld and its spiritual successors will definitely interest anyone interested in the dungeons themselves both as a contiguous entity in the game world, and as a rich and plausible setting that engages the player through questing and NPC interaction. It's been a while since we saw Azrael Darkthorn. I bet he died in the crypt, dirty tomb raider that he is. For fans of old-school tomb delving, trap dodging, secret hunting and platforming action, you can't go wrong with the classic Tomb Raider titles. Those who are attracted to Death Trap Dungeon's dark fantasy sword fighting should definitely check out Severance Blade of Darkness. It shares Death Trap Dungeon's slightly clunky tank controls, but also features infinitely better designed, deeper, and more rewarding melee combat, and at the time of writing has just received an updated re-release on GOG. It seems redundant to point out the Souls games to players who were drawn to Death Trap Dungeon's infamous difficulty, but it's worth noting the extent to which they design their dungeons around the save mechanics, almost an accidental spiritual successor to the system used in Death Trap Dungeon. It's also an appropriate comparison since developers FromSoft reportedly cited the fighting fantasy books as an influence on their proto-Souls series, Kingsfield. Some people might therefore consider FromSoft's titles a more faithful adaption of the Death Trap Dungeon experience than Death Trap Dungeon itself. But despite appearances, Death Trap Dungeon isn't completely relegated to obscurity, as some sort of also-ran fantasy Tomb Raider. Some old-school fans, such as Hidden Palace and On Scene 64 contributor Moondog, never forgot the game, and have even uncovered unreleased builds from early 1998 but more obscure chapters of Death Trap Dungeon's development history, those early prototype builds from 1996 or 1997, have never been released to the public, and details regarding the sequel that Eidos claimed was in development are scarce. So there's still a lot of information regarding the game that I think would be of interest to people. We'll leave Death Trap Dungeon on that note, then. An interesting experiment, as Ian Livingstone himself called it in 2014. And though seemingly not an experiment Livingstone is proud of, it's one that some people still remember fondly. <laughs>